Hi, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins here reporting for Boss Sports, uh, where black men control the conversation. And uh, I had I, I received an email the other day, and I had the opportunity to hear from uh, the brother who's on the line with me today, uh, Mr. Derek Brower. Uh, Derek uh, played with uh, Syracuse University back in the 1980s. Uh, from what I understand, and he could tell you more about this, uh, he actually played in the Final Four. Uh, he, and he's had a real interesting journey uh, with with his life as well as the NCAA. And uh, he's got a lot to say. He's got a whole lot to say, and I and I and I, I found it quite intriguing, and that's why I wanted to talk to this brother. Uh, so coming in all the way from Sydney, Australia, how you doing today, man? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me, Doctor. Uh, no, no problem, brother. The pleasure is all mine. Now, um, I, w- I was I was intrigued by uh, by your email. Uh, you you were telling me about a book that you were writing about your experience, and 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 you were you were a good basketball player. Uh, you you had to be good just to get to that level. But then even at that level, you you guys excelled at that time, right? When you went to the Final yeah. Four, is that correct? Yes, yes. I was on the. Uh, I was. I attended Syracuse between eighty four and eighty eight, and uh, in eighty seven, I was on uh, Bayheim's uh, first championship team that lost to Indiana. Okay, and that's uh, you know, and that that was that key smart fadeaway jump. Is that right? <laughs> Is yeah, that, yeah. Please, please don't remind me. Please don't remind me. Yeah. Oh, sorry, man. Didn't yeah, mean to bring I, up bad yeah. memories. Yeah, I, you know it's funny. I was actually uh, in Louisville, Kentucky at the time, and so we had a lot of Indiana fans because I, Louisville is on the border of Indiana, so we had a lot of IU fans down there. So I do remember that. And of course, you know, I spent some years at Syracuse University, so I know about the great basketball tradition. Now, you, um, you, you've had an interesting journey on the court and off the court, and I, and I'll, I'll kind of start with uh, your experience as an athlete um you know you were not a guy that went to college to just play basketball uh you were thinking about your academic future you know similar to what you're teaching your son who's also from what i understand a very good basketball player um you know can you tell me this um and i and i, and I can supplement with my experience teaching at syracuse for 13 years you know did you feel that that the university was as interested in your academic progress as they were in your athletic progress Absolutely not. Absolutely not. In fact, the university had no control or no interest in my academic progress. progress. It was all controlled by the athletic department. Hmm. You know, I um, I, I wrote, I write about this in my book. Um, I did not receive or have any contact with anybody from the university until my senior year. You know, um, when a person who, who um, introduced himself as my academic advisor, which I had never met for four years, and he informed me that I was 52 hours from graduating. Wait, wait, that, wait. I, um, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I got to ask you. Did you I, – I need clarification. Did you say that you didn't meet your academic advisor until your fourth year in college? Did, did I hear you yeah. correct? Yeah, absolutely. The, the way it was done was – you know, you got to remember something. Doc. I was the first one in my family to go to college, so I, you know, the system was all new to me. When I when I went to Syracuse, they introduced me to this man in the athletic department who was the athletic academic advisor. So to me, I thought he was the university's academic advisor. I thought that he, um, you know, once again, it's it's partly I, I guess my fault, but I, I trusted these people. So I trusted this man when, when we sat down and went over what I wanted to do and what I wanted to be outside of basketball. I told him, look, I wanted to go to law school. Um, I want to study psychology because I figure if you can understand why people do the things they do, it you know, could help you be a better lawyer. So he said, OK. And from that point on, I was given my class schedule. Every semester, they just handed me and said, okay, this is what you're taking. This is what you're taking. Mm. Um, toward my, and, and that's just the way it went. Now, how it goes today, because of what's happening, it don't seem like it's much different, but I can't really speak on it, but that's how it happened to me. Um, yes. Well, you know, it's, you know. In, it's interesting you say this, because uh, right now the, that, that particular university is uh, – under uh, some serious sanctions from the NCAA, many of them self-imposed. 
they're not going to be playing in postseason play this year, and I'm sure there are a bunch of other th- penalties that have come along uh, due to their um, they're not following whatever rules the NCAA puts in place. So the rules is always so complicated; I don't always get them. You know, I, I've I've never really understood uh, the pimping of the NCAA in the sense that they work so hard to restrict the freedoms and opportunities of collegiate athletes. Um, and what's even worse is that it seems that the the monetization model tends to uh, uh, exceed the academic model when it comes to what really matters to the NCAA. Because you know, let, to be fair, it, Syracuse isn't alone. And uh, in in what it's doing to college athletes, right? I mean, the University of North Carolina. It turns out they were just handing out paper paper degrees that that meant nothing. Uh, they had no value uh, to a lot of young athletes. So, do you think that, in terms of your experience with Syracuse, how much of it do you think is specific to Syracuse, and how much of it do you think is kind of a a, a systematic problem with the NCAA that also needs to be addressed? Oh, it's definitely not um, just solely Syracuse. It's a system. It's the NCAA. The system is totally based on money and revenue, and um, that's the biggest thing that they're concerned about. Hmm. I mean, you know, no, it's, it's definitely not specific to Syracuse. And, and like you said, the situation that's happening in North Carolina, it's happening. It's happening everywhere that people are winning and have these big programs, whether they be basketball or football, it's, it's inevitable. You cannot control, you know, a football team with a hundred kids and maintain all of their academic, um, you know, standards to what the university is, is, is supposed to have. So, um, but, but, but what happens is, and this is, and this is my opinion, what happens is the smart coaches, right, they have good assistants, right? Syracuse had a great assistant coach who, for many years, held all of those things in check, had maintained the, the stretching of the limits to where they didn't break. The, the rules got bent, but they, were, they weren't broken. Because it is very hard to, like, I mean, we could get into personalities. We can get into uh, uh, people's, um, you know, economic backgrounds. Um, but when you have, and I'll just use basketball, when you have a mixture of 10 different guys, you've got 10 different personalities, you have 10 different uh, um, people coming from different social backgrounds. For instance, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I played at Syracuse, do you know that me and Ronnie Sykley were the only two players who had two parents in the household. Wow, really? That's, no, that's interesting. That's interesting. And, and you know, and it's, it's, it's funny. It almost seems like in so many of these programs, the coach takes the role of the surrogate father for so many young guys. And if so if the coach is all about basketball, 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 uh, that, that – you know, that bias is going to persuade the actions and activities of the that young person. And it seems to me that uh, what is unfortunate about it is that when you're 18, 19, 20 and the lights are shining and, 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 and everybody's loving you, uh, it's hard to think about, you know, what's going to happen after the lights go off. You know, what? how, how is this man going to treat me once I am no longer making money for him? Right. Because it does come down to the money. And so I want to ask you this, man. And you can tell me if you can answer this, if you feel comfortable, if you don't, that's fine. Um, do you feel, you know, in your experience in terms of dealing with Jim Beheim after you left Syracuse, do you feel that that he's been uh, as supportive of players when they're off the court as he is when they're making money for him on the court? Um, in my personal experience, absolutely not. Um, and, um, once again, I, I touch upon this in my book and it goes into a, a few other things that I find that pe- I think people will find interesting, um, that the semester after I was finished at Syracuse, he had no use for me. Hmm. I mean, and, um, and I can honestly say that there are, I'm in contact with a lot of ex players who, um, he he does absolutely nothing for now. They, they, I'm sure there are a few, um, you know, Carmelo, um, Derek Coleman, 
But then I would ask myself, what really does Carmelo Anthony need from Jim Beheim? I would ask myself, what really does Derek Coleman, the first number one pick from Syracuse University, 15 NBA, what, what does he need from Jim Beheim? You know, what I would ask is, where's Andre Hawkins? He might need something from Jim Beheim. Where's, you know, and, and like I said, you know, and I only mention Hawk because I love Hawk. You know what I mean? And, um, the, you know, my personal opinion is no. And, and, and I've been around basketball, um, I, as you know, but I'm talking about afterwards. I actually, one of my best friends grow, growing up was Danny Green, okay, senior. His son now plays for the San Antonio Spurs, okay? I went through the whole recruiting process with little Danny. I sat in there when coaches came, coaches, one of, and, and, and it's ironic that, that we're talking about one of the, one of the coaches that impressed me the most is where he obviously ended up going was North Carolina and Roy Williams. Not because of what the school, because of what he said, he said, and, and, and I've watched coach Williams actions with other players that I know. And he, and he's truthful to it. He said, we're not, he said, not only are we here to make you a better basketball player, but we are going to make you a better man. And look, whatever disagreements he had with Rashawn McCann's, like I said, but I've, I've seen Danny, I've seen other people and I've, and I've seen the effort that Roy has made Roy Williams. So I got to tip my hat to him. He's kept his word. He's there's players that I've known things that he has done behind the scenes. So in that sense, you know, and, and, and then and then there's a there's there's a whole bunch of other coaches that um that I know that do specific things. Jay Wright is another one from Villanova. You know what I mean? They do a lot of things to to help their, their ex players in, in in whatever way they can. And to me, a man who has spent over 40 years at an institution, has won all these games that he has won, has countless alumni across the nation. Nah, he, he doesn't he doesn't do anything to help his um his former players, well, in my opinion. Well, you know, that, that's so interesting. Um, because it, that that seems to be the story that's consistently you know told around the country. Um, you know, I, I, I grew up as a big Louisville fan. Uh, a lot of people had things like that to say about the coaches there. Um, at Kentucky, uh, when I was teaching at Kentucky, I remember there was a, a certain superstar player who uh, uh, went to the NBA who who could not read. The professors knew he could not read, but everyone uh, protected him from the penalties of not being able to read because he took the team to the Final Four, went to the NBA, eventually lost. He eventually went broke, but uh, and when when that happened, I remember thinking, I remember when that kid couldn't read and nobody stood up for him at that time. Um, you know, and you can go down the list. Um, you know, I've had arguments. I had an argument. I mean, this wasn't basketball, Sarah, because this was actually football. And I had an argument with a uh, an assistant coach because he can't, he said the first week of class he sends me an email says uh, the quarterback so and so is in your class he's gonna miss the first two days because he's got a game to get ready for. I said okay, well, all right, well he's gonna start off behind, but if that's what you guys do, that's fine. Then he sends me another email the next week saying, oh, well, he's got to miss the next week of class because he's got a game out in Utah and he's got to get ready for that game. And I said. And that's when I got a little upset. I said, number one, you're setting this young guy up for failure because my class is difficult. If you miss two weeks of my class, you will fail. And I'm not going to give him a, a bullshit grade. I'm not going to, you know, inflate anything, uh, you know, to, to because he plays football. I'm going to treat him like the rest of the students. I said, number two, I thought that he was here to get an education. Um, it, I thought that sports was supposed to be extracurricular. Uh, I thought sports was something you do in addition to your academic pursuits, but you're treating sports as if that is the primary reason that these athletes are here. And, and of course, I knew the answer to my own question. We know that because the NCAA makes more money uh, in March Madness, for example, than the, the playoffs for the NFL and the NBA combined, you know, this is real money. This is real money. And right. certain people are getting paid. The Bayheims are getting rich. You know, I'm sure Jim Bayheim has got a few million dollars in the bank. Uh, you know, mostly white guys are getting wealthy off this and then you got a lot of kids coming from the hood that are being used up for three or four years and then being spit back out um and so and so i i've, I've seen it as well and i know you saw it up close uh but i want to ask you this um you know uh and i want to talk specifically about uh and i hope this is okay about your son your son is a, is a, from what i read he, he's a baller too he's got his dad's jeans and uh and he's going to be heavily recruited um 
what are you saying to your son? What advice are you giving your son in terms of learning from uh, your experience, uh, good and bad choices and things that you've seen over the years about what to expect, you know, as a prize athlete going into the system? Well, um, that's a great question. I'm just telling him to remember that his that basketball is a is a vehicle, is a is, is a tool to take you someplace else. You know what I mean? He can't rely on just um, just being a basketball player. And 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 he's he's still young. He's in year ten, so he hasn't decided what he wants to do um, um, for a career. But to but to to get to the heart of your question, see, the problem is this. Most kids who come to a school like Syracuse or get the chance to attend that for football, about for any sport, they have come from a situation where they have been coddled by wherever they're coming from, okay? And especially let's use Syracuse basketball. Each kid that they have coming in next year, right, in their own room, they want to be the next Carmelo Anthony. They want to be the next Tyler Ennis. They want to be the next Jeremy Grant. They're not thinking about being the next whoever was the, you know, uh, the leading academic guy at Syracuse in the last. So basketball is already what they're focused on. What happened, and, and, and that's what kids, kids are, you know, they, 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 you know, they got tunnel vision. What happens is when you get to the university and nobody expands your vision, when they say, nah, it's okay to just look at this. That's right, that's right. When it's okay, that's where, to me, the crime is. Because a kid may dream about being the next Carmelo Anthony, but as an adult, we should know the percentages and the chances and the role. And that's what, see, that's the lie they tell you when they come into your home, when they come in to recruit you. Because no parent would, would send their child to a coach who's going to say, yeah, listen, all we're going to do is play basketball. We don't care about that. No, they don't say that. They come in with the, we have this. They bring you all these books of all these buildings you never see. <laughs> and they tell you about all these professors you never see. Then when you get there as an 18, 19-year-old kid, and they tell you, listen, you don't have to go to class. Don't worry about it. Most kids are like, hey, that's great. Now, you do. You do have... The, the brothers like the one I seen speak in front of the NCAA from Florida State who end up being a Rhodes Scholar who... who, who, who yeah, the football player. Who, um, I don't remember right. name, but I know you're talking about. Now, he said it very poignantly. He was like, his case is not the rule. It's the exception. He was the exception. He had, he had somebody put it in him the understanding of, look, you use this. They'll let you do whatever you want at this university. You use that. Don't just stay in the basketball office. You can be in new house. You can be in management. You, they, and, 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 and most kids, because that takes too much of their time. See, it's a time issue. We don't need you spending time studying. You need to practice your foul shots. <laughs> you know? Well, you know. So it's a it's a it's an individual. Not, I'll just end it here. It, it really goes down to the to the, the to the kid, but the university makes it easier because most kids choose not to study. That's just the fact of life. You know what I mean? Most kids don't come with that strong academic work. You know, especially black kids. You know, even playing basketball. Let you know he was a poor student in high school. So what makes you think he's going to be a, a great student when there's nobody watching him in college? Well, you know, I, I agree with you on that point. I think that, um, well, first of all, just so people know, the, the, the scholar that we were talking about is Myron Roll. And, uh, and it's funny because Myron got a lot of pushback when he was uh, trying out for the NFL and told them that he had other goals in life beyond sports. And they interpreted that to mean that he's not committed to football. Oh, well, you're, you're not you're, you're not a serious athlete because you're not giving 100 percent of your mind and body to this endeavor that we have in front of you, which unfortunately for most NFL players lasts about two or three years. And so, uh, right. you know, I think that as black men, there is that issue of, you know, our our amazing, extraordinary athletic ability. And I don't care what anybody says there. The, 
you know, hundreds of years of slavery has has built us up genetically in a certain way that white folks can't match. That, that's just, I mean, people won't talk about it, but it's real. When you put some a, a group of people through what we went through, and we have to survive what we went through, uh, you're gonna get to a point where we have athletes that are literally almost like superheroes. There, there is no white version of LeBron James. There is no white Shaquille O'Neal. There is no white Kobe Bryant. Right. So, right. so, so the the reality is that sometimes. Our athletic ability becomes this tremendous gift, which opens the door to so many opportunities, but it, it can be a curse because, um, you know, what it reminds me of, man, is it reminds me of the Hunger Games. Uh, you ever seen that movie by chance? Yes. Yeah. It, it, you know how in the Hunger Games, you've got these games where 30 something, a bunch of people get together. Everybody dies except one. But the one right. person who survives is boosted up as a symbol of hope to everyone else to say if you behave if you follow the system if you believe in the system you could be like this person here so they'll show you that one person who survived but they won't show you all the others who died along the way and when i see a lebron james on tv being marketed to a little black kid as a symbol of hope this is what you can be you're the best basketball player on your third grade team you could be like lebron they're not showing you the other thousands of young black men who dedicated everything to sports and ended up at the age of 24 with a with a third grade reading level, you know. And so I think that it's uh, I think that your point is a- absolutely accurate. Um, I will say this: if if they brought in all the regular students, you know, let's say non athletic students, and they brought them to campus and said, "You don't have to go to class. Uh, you we want you to focus on whatever it is you want to do. You know, we it's all about party." So- Social activities. There you, you know go. I mean? We want we want you to just party all the time. Don't worry about coming to class. You ain't got to study. Well, most of them wouldn't study either. I mean, a lot of people put because a lot of people put that on the athlete instead of the coaches. You know, if if you've got a fifty year old man mentoring an eighteen year old kid, that fifty year old has an obligation to provide guidance to that young man. And if he's not doing it, he should be held accountable. You can't look at the eighteen year old. A lot of people do this too. They'll say, well, if they're not getting the education, it's their fault. Well, I mean, I think a lot of guys figure it out when they're 28 29 30 they look back and say man this system screwed me but when you're 18 you just don't know that you know so uh, so i want to ask you this um can you tell me tell me about your book man i mean you know what what what, what's in it uh what's the title i don't have the title in front of me uh but i want people to know about that as well all right yeah the book is called the fifth quarter um because it's basically describes uh, i mean i i you i picked that title because um you know it's my life after basketball, you know. Um, the book is basically about my journey, just growing up on Long Island and um, some of the people that I've encountered along the way. I mean, um, I grew up with a with a guy who went on to become a famous rapper and, and a TV star by the name of LL Cool J, great friend of mine. Um, like I said, um, I grew up with a, another friend who... His son is now in the NBA, uh, Danny Green. And Danny Green Jr. plays for the San Antonio Spurs. So it's just about us as, a, as, as young kids and, and how our lives just went in different directions. And, and, um, and then I touch on the things in, that happened at Syracuse, uh, you know, different stories about uh, interactions with different players. And, and, and choices. Basically, the book is about choices because ultimately a choice I made ended up um, sending me to federal prison. And then after coming out of prison, I had to rebuild everything that I had worked for up to that point, including my reputation, uh, my academic degree. And, and, and it goes on to uh, explain um, my relationship with Beheim, and I guess it would um, explain, and, and it also deals with some of the issues that they're going through right now, uh, and, and, and that's very ironic. Mm. Well, you know, I think that's interesting, man. I, I definitely want to check your book out. I love that. I love that title, the fifth quarter. I think that every aspiring athlete needs to understand that there is a fifth quarter and a sixth and a seventh, you know, and and and, and, and life does not start and end just with with what happens, you know, when you're playing sports. And um, and I and, and so the last question I'm going to ask you is this: um, you know, with your son, I I I couldn't help but to just 
have so much admiration for what your son's accomplished. I mean, just so people know, his son's 16, or he's he's in the 10th grade. But but last I saw, he's averaging about 23 and a half points a game. So he's he's a serious baller. So let me ask you this, you know, and I went through this as as a parent. You know, my 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 one of my adopted kids, um, she was uh, the number one high jumper in the country, and so she got you know you know how it is when you, when your child's athletic, the letters pour in from everywhere. And uh, she yeah. asked me where I thought she should go, uh, and uh, she had actually said I want to go to Syracuse. And I said, well, um, I'll support you, but I don't think that's where you should go. Um, and she asked me where I thought she should go. I said, I think you should go to Columbia because you're going to get a, a great athletic experience and an awesome academic experience. And she went to Columbia and she graduated in four years and everything was great. She also won the um, conference championship, I think, six times or something in the high jump. Um, and so <clears throat> I want to ask you. Your son, as, as a great athlete, colleges are already swooping in. It, you know, all the vultures are going to start trying to pick that little piece of, you know, make make money off our kids like they do. Um, and your son says, hey, you know, uh, Jim Beheim reached out to me and they're interested in me coming to Syracuse. Uh, what do you say to your son uh, when he asks you if he if you, if he should follow in his dad's footsteps on that regard? Well, um, look, Syracuse University is a great university. I loved playing there. Um I would, to be honest with you, I would have no problem with him going to Syracuse only because, and this may sound crazy, but because I went there, I, I know how to control the machine. <laughs> they wouldn't be able to pull no, they wouldn't be able to pull anything over on me and I would be able to, um, yeah, pull the strings that I wanted to pull. And, and, and to be honest with you, you know, that's why guys go there. Syracuse, you can do one year at Syracuse and go straight to the NBA if that's all you want to do. Now, you you can have a great year at Washington State and no one will know. You know, you you have a good year at Syracuse and, uh, you know, that's a, look, at the, look at the young kid they got there now who hurt his leg. He wasn't even playing well and they talking about him going to the NBA, you know. So, so you know, um, it, it, it would depend on, on what realistically um, – what realistic evaluation I had of my son, you know, um, and what he wanted to do. If, if, if he wanted to, and I know this is a long drawn out question, but I'll, 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 I'll compare it to this. A lot of people are mad about what Tyler Ennis did, right? See, to me, that's, that's, that's dumb because people go, no matter no, what you, you go no, to. Let, let me ask you this. Uh, when you say mad about what Tyler Ennis did, uh, explain that for people who don't, don't know. Okay. Tyler Ennis went to Syracuse for one year, had a decent year, and entered the draft. Now, he's bouncing back from the D-League to the NBA, and, you know, mostly Syracuse fans, they always comment about the fact that he should have stayed and got better, and, and, and no, no, no. People go to college for financial independence and knowledge, okay? That is the job he chose. To play basketball so he achieved the financial independence part all right now it's up to him to acquire the knowledge to continue to achieve in that field staying at Syracuse and being controlled by Jim and when he should play and when he should come out no that manipulates his career now so that was a great business move on his behalf and any kid that 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 really goes to college to play, and they, and they are, there are a lot of kids who their main focus is just to be an athlete. And is that right or is that wrong? No. But there are some kids who come there and want both. And those who are not given both, especially the academic part, that's a problem. If a kid comes there and he has the ability to do one year and go straight to the NBA, God bless him. Well, absolutely, you know, absolutely. I mean, because if he's not, if his family's not getting the money from his labor, then somebody else is, you know. And I think if, if the NCAA was all that concerned about athletes leaving early, they would, they would at least let them earn money, right, in some way. You don't even have to pay the athletes; just give them access to their own, their own rights, the rights to their own image, you know. So if I want to go, you know what they could do, Doc, not to cut you off. You know what they could do to really, to really help the athletes, and they won't do this, and it's so simple. Giving money is hard because then, then the, then the, then the envelopes just get bigger. They already do give money; they just pretend and they don't. What they could do that would really help the athletes is monitor a 
program that institutes jobs after they graduate, an employment program for athletes after they finish. So you look at, you got these kids that graduate, let's hook them up with alumni over here and let's see how well we are doing at employing our former athletes after they finish. That's simple to do. A job creation network. I love it, man. I think that's a great recommendation. That is a great recommendation. And, and you're right about, you know, in terms of athletes getting money under the, under the table. When when I hear about that, um, you know, people think that somehow I feel like the school is breaking the rules. And I say, no, actually, I'm glad they're doing that. that that's, that's what makes sense. You're participating in a multi-billion dollar industry. Why should you not be compensated for that? It's ridiculous. You know, when, uh, I don't know if you remember when Reggie Bush, they made a big deal about his mother getting a, you know, a little bit of money in a, or a house or something like that. I said his mother should be able to buy three houses. <laughs> but for all the money Reggie Bush made for USC, you know, he made millions for that school. His family right. should get a piece of that. That is, you know, that's the way America is supposed to work. You know, so. Uh, hey, let me, I, let me drop another clue to you, Doc. And this is what a lot of kids don't know. When you sign your scholarship, right, it's about five, six, bunch of pages, bunch of little writing. You know what I mean? Most kids just go right to the bottom line. It's, there's one page that says, I do not give the university the right to use my image. You are allowed to not sign that page. Mm. Now, I have a friend who's a former Syracuse athlete who knew this, high-profile athlete who knew this. He did not sign it. They still did it. And you know how that works out in the legal system. I love it. I love it. I love it. So there you go. So uh, there is a clause. There is a clause that says, I do not give the unit. And they can't revoke your scholarship for that. You know, you know, if you become a great star, you say, look, you can't sell my image to Coca-Cola to nobody else without my permission. You don't have to sign that page. Well, I love it. I love it. Because from what I understand, if you don't sign that page, they own the rights to your image in perpetuity throughout the universe. I think they don't they say something crazy like that, that we own your, your image, even if even if it's on another planet. <laughs> they own your image if you're marking it on right. mars the ncaa right. can, can do that which which is right. crazy to me well you know hey man i i have enjoyed this conversation um i have learned so much and um and and and, and maybe later on when your book is, is is out there for everybody to pick it up uh you and i can talk again uh, because i think people should Absolutely. read it and i think that a lot of uh you know any parents watching who have young people in their lives who are athletically gifted understand this system you got to learn from from brothers like like this uh who can explain to you uh that not everybody is going to always have your best interests at heart so i want to say thank you man um i really appreciate your time it's a great conversation Thank you, Doctor. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody. This is Mr. Derek Brower. He is a former uh, college athlete, uh, but among, so many other things. He's he's a, he's a father. He's he's a successful man. He's also the author of a book called The Fifth Quarter. And uh, when it comes out, I suggest you you look for it and buy it. And uh, remember, talk to your kids about how this this sports thing works because uh, it can be an avenue for opportunity or an avenue for exploitation, depending on how you use it. Well, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Ball Sports, and until we meet again, please stay strong, be blessed, and be educated. We are gone. Peace.